Good afternoon, all. Steve Parisi here at the IBC Global. Hope the day is off to a fantastic start. On today's podcast slash, slash joint call, uh, we've got a usual guest, a good friend, Mr. Denzel Rodriguez. Denzel, how are you today? Doing well, my friend. Thanks for having me again. It's always an honor and privilege. I'm excited to dive into today's topic regarding agent commissions and providing full transparency. So it's always it's always fun to discuss these topics as we you know we dive really deep into it. Um, I always get excited being able to collaborate with you on a on a regular basis. So thank you. Yeah, the feeling is mutual. Thanks so much. And yeah, today will definitely be a good topic. And kind of when you had brought it up to me, the way you had presented it, um, the question always comes up. I know from a consumer's perspective, when someone's taking out a policy a whole life insurance policy that is, if their goal is cash value, like that's why they're taking out the policy to maximize the cash value and then use it. Commissions do come up a lot of times. And I think what it is, I know for me, when I first got into the business and was learning how to model these policies, the question I'd always ask my managers and superiors were, hey, is there a way I can lower my commission in order to maximize the cash value and make it more attractive for the consumer? And the answer is yes, really, just when you look at how whole life insurance works. But then when you get different products, which have different commission payout rates and there's different splits and everything, it can get confusing sometimes, um, kind of what we had discussed over the past week or so. So today we will have some fun. Um, I guess let me know where you'd like to start, because we can start with the overall policy design and such, or we can jump into the products that you had in mind, anywhere in particular, at least people that you're speaking with, where you feel that, that they'd like to begin. Yeah, we can jump right into the illustration, the designs that we wanted to uh, go ahead and present to our audience today. Okay. Um, I believe that the audience that we're speaking to are, have already been binge watching our stuff. And um, and they're really curious to dive into the the meat and potatoes. Um, they're they're hearing you know information on other channels, and they get a little confused. So want to be able to go straight to the source, which is right. where we, you know, the insurance company, how these uh, policies are being designed, and then the actual uh, breakdown of the commission based on the design that we choose. So yeah, we can we can start right there. Got it. Got it. And a question you had as well to get it even more specific. This was before we started the call today was on different products. Like if you take a whole life 100 product, call it a traditional whole life insurance policy compared to a high early cash value product and really going through the differences, A, from the consumer's perspective, how to maximize cash value, but then B, like what's the agent's incentive if there is an incentive to sell one product versus another? Yes. Definitely, okay. especially so, especially as it relates to the uh, split design of where the client's money is going when they you know pay in say ten grand or hundred grand or higher than that, um, where where those dollars are being divided and how okay. that affects agent commission either positively or negatively. Got it. Okay, let's have some fun with that. So. What I would like to start with, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. So let's start with different products first and just kind of giving a general breakdown. We'll pull up some numbers as well. This way people can actually see if I'm paying a dollar into the policy, what does that actually look like for me, the consumer? So we've got two policies up here. We've got a whole life 100 policy. This is often referred to as a traditional old school whole life insurance product. What the 100 represents is literally the age you can make premiums to the policy if you wanted to, till you're 100 years old. No one really does that, <laughs> but that's how long you can pay into it if you wanted to. Versus this guy, high early cash value, short, heck V. Not many companies offer this type of product. It is a whole life insurance product. Uh, if you look at companies out there, you'll have Mass Mutual that offers it to just about anyone of any funding level. If you get to higher dollar amounts, you'll see a lot of corporations purchase these type of types of products. As an example, Guardian has one that has a minimum base premium requirement of 100 grand per year. It's a higher requirement. My point is, 
it is a whole life insurance product. You'll see it kind of in the name, high early cash value, how it works, but they're two separate whole life insurance policies. What we're gonna look at in today's study is these two products with the same company, Mass Mutual in this case. So let's use a clean number of $10,000 per year, just in this example. So if you said to me, Steve, I'd like to pay in $10,000 per year to a life insurance policy, and my goal is maximum cash value. I'm interested in the traditional whole life insurance policy, and this high early cash value product is intriguing to me. When we look at the actual design, you can choose where your money goes. You can go toward the insurance premium or toward the PUA rider. Premium dollars with a whole life 100 product, the traditional product, do not show up in cash value in the first two years of, policy, of a policy. So if your premium is $10,000, $1,000, wherever we set that base premium, you will not see it show up in cash value in the first and second year. Now, if we're looking at Mass Mutual, if $10,000 is your total annual payment, that's the max you ever want to pay, the lowest we can set that base premium is 10%. That is as low as Mass Mutual will permit. And the premium does drive the death benefit heavily. But I know today's topic is heavily focused on cash value. Any questions on that piece or anything thus far? Nope, pretty clear. Okay. So if you've got 10K going in, if 1,000 is your base premium, we will have a term rider attached. That could be part of the PUA payment as well. But in short, I want 90% or as much money as I can allocated toward that paid up addition rider to beef up my cash value. And why we want that term insurance rider, in case someone's new, is a term insurance rider is a cheap way, if you don't like the word cheap, a cost-effective way to add more life insurance. And the death benefit, the total amount of life insurance we have, has a direct relationship to that MEC limit. In short, we're preventing a taxable event from occurring. Questions on any of that? Make sense? That makes sense. Just breaking down the initial structure of any policy regarding whole life, premium, PUA, that's where my money uh, can only go into those two locations. And then of the, of the PUA, there's a, a second component, which is term insurance, uh, mm -hmm. which is involved in that nine grand. So nothing above 10,000 bucks, right? So it's not like 9,000 goes to PUA, 1,000 goes to uh, base premium, and then another couple hundred dollars or so goes to term. So that would be more than 10K. That's not the case here. It's 10K total, where of that nine grand, majority of that's going to cash value day one, um, and then it's covering the PUA expense charge as well as that term uh, cost to come up Correct. with that, that death benefit, that total death benefit. Correct, you got it. The main takeaway, again, as we once we transition into comparing these two products is Whole Life 100, a traditional product, the base premium, zero cash value in the first two years. Versus, say you've got the exact same dollar amount going into a higher early cash value product, 10 grand per year. So how this will work, if we do the same thing, minimize that premium, say it's $1,000, what you will see with this high early cash value product is approximately 80% of the base premium shows up in cash value in the first year. If you have an older product that was purchased before 2022, used to be about 90% the first year. <clears throat> but with product and industry changes, it's 80%. So 10, if a $1,000 premium goes in, I'd have about $800 of that in cash value. $10,000 premium would result in about $8,000 in cash value of the premium piece alone, that is excluding any PUA payments. 
questions on that? Okay, so just to be clear, just by making a simple switch in the name of the policy option so the client can say, okay, yeah, I'm looking at this L100, and then I can ask the agent, hey, can you show me a high early cash value design by making that request, or heck V for short, um, 80% of the base premium would show up in cash value in the first year as opposed to an L100 where 0% shows up in the first year, right? That so that's, that, that's mm -hmm. the only switch that just occurred so far. Correct. Yeah, 100% right. correct. And the reason why that question comes up, why is there a difference there? Is with a traditional whole life insurance policy, whatever your base premium is, going back to the whole life 100 product, really how the insurance company would explain it to us is that they are going to overcharge you for the cost of insurance, the base premium in the first and second year. Whereas the high early cash value product, they're not going to overcharge us up front. What's interesting is you'll notice that the, the actual insurance charges are a little bit higher on the base premium. They're just spread out over the life of the policy. And it's kind of in the name high early cash value product. A lot of times what you'll see is very strong upfront cash values, not as strong long-term values just because they're giving more upfront, but you've got a little bit more drag long-term. But to get back on track here, the main, main difference is you will see that base premium payment credit the cash value, the majority of it credit the cash value right out of the gates. Gotcha. So this allows for more cash value straight up day one, where that other $9,000, that's also going to PUAs, mm -hmm. uh, term cost, where you have that $800 guaranteed. Um, for the base premium. So okay. even if I had, a, let's say, a $4,000 base premium, 80% of that number yeah. shows up in cash value, the other, say, 6,000 in PUAs, portion of that shows up in cash value, the number would be relatively the same? Be very similar. Very yeah, similar. Got, yep, so question there is, if you've got a high early cash value, and if you have, like the example we've got down here, a 1090 design, meaning of the $10,000, 10% is toward the premium, we're minimizing that, versus a 4060. Correct, the cash values would be similar right out of the gates, that was your question? Yeah. Okay, got it. That is correct, they'd be similar initially, long term you would see a difference from a the consumer's point of view and the agent's point of view as well. Okay. So from here, here, now mm -hmm. it seems like we could dive into looking like those at those agent commissions with those two types of designs, 1090, 4060 on a on a heck V. Um, so that we can see, okay, how does that affect it? And how does yeah. that influence the decision of the of the client? Gotcha. So starting with the agent first then what does the and this will, this will help like? agents that you know watch our channel that are looking to become an insurance agent they kind of have a really good idea of what to expect true So when you get into agent commissions, you've got what are referred to as, let's refer to it starting level commissions, base compensation, and then you've got overrides and bonuses, all that fun stuff. So right. for the sake of simplicity, I will start with the basic commissions here. I won't make it super complex. I've got a tendency, tendency to do that too much sometimes. So what we've got here, when you take a traditional old school whole life insurance policy, a legacy 100 or whole life 100, in that same example we just looked at. So going back to the whiteboard. So if I've got 10K per year going in, same design we just described, a premium of $1,000, and then a PUA rider of 
$9,000 for a total of 10, what would the compensation look like? And we're looking at just the base minimum commissions first, then we'll look at the maximum commissions an, an agent would be paid if they're producing a lot of business. You gotta earn your way up. Right, that makes right. Sense. And this is the traditional whole life L100 product, not the Hecvi design. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Cool. So here we've got the base premium. So I'm paying in $10,000 per year. Base premium is $1,000. First year, so BP represents base premium percentage. This is the commission rate the insurance company will pay an agent in the first year. From Mass Mutual. Correct. This is specific right. to a Mass Mutual Whole Life 100 product. Mm -hmm. $1,000. So 55% of $1,000 is $550. <laughs> and then on their PUA rider, which full transparency, if you ever if you ever look at a Mass Mutual illustration, their PUA riders are termed as Ailer and then Lisser. So here we've got a 1090 split, $9,000 PUA payment. They pay a 2% commission rate on PUAs. So 2% of $9,000 is 180 bucks. Clear, cool. Total, total compensation the agent would make in the first year, 730 bucks. And then what you'll see with traditional products on Whole Life 100, for example, is they do pay renewal commissions years two through 10 of 5% per year. Very important side note, all companies tend to have different renewal rates and different ways they pay it out. Some companies have products where they'll pay it's a 10% renewal years two through four, then it drops to 3%. Here with the Whole Life 100, this is the most traditional setup, heavy up front, 5% years two through 10. And then if they it. keep funding PUA, yeah, same thing here. But there's the commission on the base premium. Questions on that, if any. Interesting, so that means that a new agent just starting out, this is what they could expect to uh, generate in their say their first policy they sell uh doing 1090 split split on a l100 product that is the baseline the lowest commission you can possibly get paid is right is these numbers right here don't go no correct yep okay. it'll probably be higher because a lot of agencies will start people higher than the base rate i'll also add that this assumes the agent is receiving a 100% case case share because if you're right. in the business a lot of times yeah you're splitting business with someone else <clears throat> right right so let's just say i am an agent i work with you know you and your agency there would be a split there so of the 730 that would get, that would get split amongst the agency and the agent correct but if i was working remote i could expect to see that whole 730 correct gotcha so you've got a 1090 whole life 100 product, and then we've got the high early cash value product. And your question was a 4060, and then a, we also put together a 1090. So let's look at the 4060 first. So same high early cash value product. And the 1090 of that whole life 100 product did have, did have a term insurance rider. This, does not have a term insurance rider. Because there's a higher base, so there's no need to put Correct. Term. Correct. So you've got the same 10K per year going in, base premium, $4,000. What do you notice in the first year commission with the higher early cash value product compared to the whole life 100? Much less. 11%. Yep. Why do you think that is? We go back to the whiteboard, like how that crediting works to cash value. Like you mentioned before in, on the other whiteboard that the insurance company is, not, is no longer overcharging in the beginning years. Mm -hmm. And they're actually spreading that out, which you mentioned about that drag later on. 
that you've got say. it. Yeah. So for, think of it this way: that, that that's correct. And here's a nice way to kind of illustrate it: if you and I are the insurance company, and a client's going to pay in four thousand dollar base premium, and we're going to give them eighty percent of that that uh four thousand dollar payment in cash value immediately. We only have so much left over that we can pay the agent in the first year. Right. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So main takeaway here, big difference in the first year, 11% commission on the high early cash value product. Now, again, this premium's at $4,000, right? Because the right. question that was brought up is 1090 whole life 100 compared to a 4060 high early cash value. Which one gives me more money as the consumer and which one pays more commission to the agent? So here, 11%, $440 in first year commission compared to the Whole Life 100 product, $550 in first year commission. We've got a PUA payment, six grand, 2%. There's the commission. Total first year with the high early cash value product, 560 bucks. So in the first year, it is true that that Whole Life 100 product, even with a minimum base premium, paid you more than the higher early cash value product with a higher base premium in the first year. Does that make sense? Correct. Yep. In the first okay. year. But cool. as we start to look, something changes. Correct. So the key difference with the higher early cash value product is when we look at renewals, there's no drop in compensation. So they continue to pay 11% per year. And they do that through the 10th year. Most whole life insurance products commission stop after 10 years. Some still will have service fees, or perhaps they pay a 2% renewal commission or something like that. But for the most part, you'll see commissions stop after 10 years, the renewal commissions that is. Got it. And again, this 11%, on the HEC V and the 55% on the L100, this is the absolute lowest possible Correct. commission that the insurance company is issuing or giving to the agent. You, you can't get paid any less than this. This is the standard that the mass mutual insurance company sets, not any agency that you or I or any agent that gets themselves affiliated with. It's the lowest Correct. possible. Okay, cool. Correct, absolute minimum. So what ends up happening here is by the second year, you've made more with the higher early cash value product because you're making 560 each year. So the column on the far right takes the total compensation we've made with all years combined. So we've got up top to the whole life 100. After 10 years, you've made $2,800. Whereas with that higher early cash value product, you've made literally double. $5,600. I see. Mm -hmm. For the same dollar amount and same funding period, mm -hmm. the agent makes more money on the heck V design with yep. the 40-60 split. Yeah. Um, so they're rewarded over a longer period of time and with more cash, more commissions. So now the question becomes from the client perspective is, okay, this is the absolute lowest that I know that this agent's going to make with this particular company. And there's these two designs, L100 or HEC V. How does that affect my cash value over the long haul on a 4060 versus the uh, 1090 L100, right? But before we get into that, let's also look at a 1090 heck v design because that also exists right where we Correct. can see a a, a a more clear uh comparison yeah. apples to apples with a heck v 4060 and a heck v 1090. yeah so here we go heck v 1090 thousand dollar base premium same 11 percent 110 dollars per year there's the PUA, 290 bucks in the first year. Look at that. Over so, 10 years. Cut in half. 
Correct. 2,900 so as opposed to 56. 56. What's interesting though, whole life 100 is up top. You've got the, the bottom of the whole life 100, which is the total compensation that's been earned after 10 years, 2,800 bucks compared to the high early cash value, 2,900 bucks. It's like, who cares at that point? There's not much of a difference there. But hundred dollar difference. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. If all things are equal from a design perspective, meaning my base premium is the same, my PUA payment's the same, I've got the same company, it's all going to work out similarly at the end of the day. Okay. Yeah, we're we're like, arguing arguing over uh, dollars and cents at this point. Correct. Yeah. What influences okay. with the main driver of compensation is and always will be that base premium. That's the key right there. The only reason this one's double is because the base premium is $4,000 instead of $1,000. Right, that's the key difference. The design yep. is, is, is great, let's just say, the heck V, the idea of high early cash value, it sounds awesome, but the uh, split is where the magic I, I would assume occurs as it relates to the person's cash value day You're one correct. starting yep. out. You're okay. correct. So we don't have to spend a lot of time on this piece just because we've got overrides and such. So I'll just call it commissions that are paid. These are extra commissions from the insurance carrier and agency to agents. So it does not impact policyholders' performance. It's kind of like if you and I start day zero with an insurance company, they say, hey, you've got to work your way up the ladder here. We're going to start you with the minimum commission rate. And if several years later, we're doing a million dollars per year with them, they say, hey, you've earned your way up to the maximum rate. Now we're going to pay you more for bringing us business, really so you keep bringing us business and someone else doesn't try and incentivize you and pay you more to bring them business instead. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now, now what you're showing here is a design of funding a hundred grand a year, right? Or so this one's still for now based on the same um, same ten k. I'll go to the hundred k next, but this just shows the overrides with the higher commission rates. Okay, so, so we just got to adjust that one number with the ninety k. Correct. Oh, you're correct. Yeah, thank you for that. The main thing you'll notice there as I do this, with circled in red instead of fifty five percent. What do you notice there? Right, it went to 93%, Correct. Near, nearly 100 of that 1,000, the agent gets paid. So that obviously, when you look at over a year, uh, over 10 years, that final number is at that 3,185. So that's, that's incentivizing for the agent that still has no effect to the um, clients cash values that your, your, your statement there, which basically saying is like, as yeah. the agent does more and more business, he or she improves, they get rewarded for, you know, putting a lot of policies in place. So the insurance company rewards that particular individual. But if you were to compare a 93% payout versus yeah. a 55% commissionable payout still would be the same net exact cash value they I, want. identical yeah think of it okay. this way you and i are now sharing in the insurance company's profits right profit sharing kind of like that hey thanks you earned your way in to really be a partner so we're going to pay you a bit more got it and is that yeah. the highest that the insurance company will go 93 um, all companies are different it does depend if they broker business in the state of new york i'll add that too mass mutual actually goes a little bit higher than this too um with some agencies that's that's the highest the agency we broker through goes. Um, and the main reason I don't try and bid for a higher rate there is just called being loyal, right? Those guys helped me at the beginning, so I'm gonna stick with them. Got it, got it. But there yeah. there is the potential where someone could get higher than 93. What would that total amount be? Uh, the with highest mass. I've seen mass right around 96%, 95 to 96 with mass. Okay. Yeah. And again, it depends on if the company solicits business in the state of New York, because if you look at some smaller companies, right, take a Lafayette Life, Foresters, 
There's several others. You can often see them between 130%. I've heard of 140, but haven't seen that. I have seen 130. I know Ohio will go up to 140. Meaning you sell a policy in the state of Ohio with a small Sorry. life insurance company like Lafayette or Foresters, there's a higher commission Sorry. payout. No, Ohio National, the insurance company. Oh, 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 sorry. Lafayette Life, the insurance company. Foresters, the insurance company. That same base premium would pay, let's call it 130%. It's very common on the base, base premium instead of the 93.5 or the 96%. Got it. Okay, yeah. clear. Cool. <clears throat> All right, so that's good stuff there. Now... I think we could, uh, unless you had something else to say on this slide here, but we could shift gears to the uh, cash value on those three designs, how it affects yeah. the client, their, their starting cash value with these different designs, L100, 1090, HEC V, 1090, or 4060, HEC V. Got it. Yep. So did that with 100K. So we just multiplied everything by 10. So what I've got up here first, just so you can see it and everyone else can, is the same commission grids, but based on 100K. So you've got a 10K base premium, the wow. Life 100 product. If you look at the base rates on the far left. Right, so the, first... this is also full transparency. The numbers stay the same, no matter how much money the client is putting in, same commissionable uh, uh, payout. So no confusion there. Um, the numbers okay. just, multiplied by 10 basically correct so up at the top you've got the whole life 100 1090 second one high early cash value 1090 and then the last one at the bottom this time high early cash value 4060 similar trend it's about twice as much with the 4060 example Make sense? Yes, very clear. All right. So let's take a look at this. So from the policyholder's perspective, I'm paying in here, the Whole Life 100 product, $100,000 per year. Where is the money going? Because when I design a policy for maximum cash value, again, where can it go? Toward the premium or toward the PUA rider? Now, why this PUA is $89,000 and change is because we have a one-year term insurance rider attached. This is a blended PUA. This provides a lot of flexibility, gradually increases. We leave it on actually for 15 years in this example to prevent a mech, but main takeaway, so I don't overcomplicate things, is if this is you, here's what you've paid. The annual outlay column, 100K per year for 10 years. There's your cash value. Crossover point between years six and seven. Stop funding all together after the 10th year. What this represents on the left Here's 11 through 15, we see the base premium. You also see the cost of the term insurance rider here. This is the base premium and term insurance rider that's still due, but you are not paying it. So if I pull it up here, we'll see the same thing. Here's the premium. Here's the total payment, 100K per year. This is our whole life 100 product. You'll see everything match the actual uh, spreadsheet we just looked at, cash values and such. Look at your annual outlay here. Zero beginning year 11. And then you see the annual surrender of $10,000. What that again represents is the base premium that's still due, but you as the policy holder are not paying it out. And the policy is paying for itself through dividends and interest. Mouthful I gave you there. Any questions on that? Very clear. Very clear. So 
Uh, just to recap, that was a 1090 split on an L100. And all we did was just increase the numbers to say funding 100 grand. The, the numbers would be identical on say funding 10 grand pretty much, yep. right? Uh, obviously the costs and all that goes down, but the same idea in terms of funding period length, uh, in this case, you're only paying into it for 10 years. All right. So it assumes like a, a, a 10 pay design. Uh, but in order to prevent the mech, the term rider has to stay on for an additional five more years as well as the base. Then it clears out. In this example, yes, it, it is right. possible to design it where you can drop the turn af term after the 10th year. Um, just we found this way is often a bit more efficient because we're funding right up to the mech limit. So sometimes we design it where we cut it after 10 years, depends on the individual's preference. Cool. Yeah. But then we've got the higher cash value product. Right. 40% base premium. 60% PUA rider, total payment of 100K per year, just about 88% right out of the gates with a 40 60. We'll look at the 1090 next, the higher early that is. But we see more cash value immediately. Break even point, very similar. Between years six and seven, you've got more cash value day one which anyone who's just looking at this purely cash value, I think I pay money into a policy, it begins to compound right away. So I should have more money long-term with the example I have up front or with the example that I've got more up front, which is the case if all things are equal from product to product, <laughs> not quite here. So, right, these are, these are technically two different products, L100 traditional yep. and a Heck V design. Heck V comes out the gate strong but yep. then starts to phase out and then Correct. the l100 starts off a little bit less but ends up beating in the long term and we can see Correct. that in even years you know the 20 30 you know as you get further and further 2.5 million as opposed to 2.3 million at age 69 yeah you got it mm -hmm. got it Correct. And it does become significant over time. But again, I mean, this is me just trying to be fair to, in this case as well. The reason why this whole Life 100 is stronger long term, because we've got a lower base premium in the beginning. Like we've got expenses that are it's 10% of the total payment instead of 40%. Cool. So, yeah. What I would do really for a fair comparison and without going back and forth, just keep this in mind. Year 20. Your cash value with that L100 product is 1.67 million. And now we're looking at a Heck V 1090, yeah. which is an apples to apples comparison of Got a 4060 Heck V. Cor correct. In the 1090 Whole Life 100, we've got more of a, the design is identical here. It's a real comparison, in my opinion. Same out of pocket, 92% right out of the gates. There's your crossover point, breaking even between years four and five. All we've done here is maximize the value from start to finish. Year 20, you've got the 171. We can look at any point in time. Let me do this. So on the left, let me just start at the top, higher early 4060. On the right, higher early 1090. Let's just go to E70. And what do you notice from a cash value difference standpoint? Boom. It's noticeable, right? Yeah. And the fascinating, yeah, what's so fascinating about this is now you've got the same company, same product, same health ratings, same out of pocket, everything's identical except for where the money is going. So here's just to validate 100K per year going in. High early cash value product, $10,000 base premium. You'll notice those values are identical to the spreadsheet. So all we do, do is just pull the values from the illustration and export them. And then here's your 4060. 
Got yeah. it. Yeah. So now the client and those are watching who are looking to put a policy in place for themselves or spouses or kids, you name it. When they are looking at quote unquote infinite banking concept, become your own banker, tax free banking, cash flow banking, all these marketing terms and all these philosophies, which are great. Right, different ways of doing things and ideas and stuff. But if we put all that to the side and now just focus in on where does my money go dollar by dollar, line by line, expense by expense, wouldn't that help me make a better financial decision? Me being the client, it's my money, not the agents. I know exactly where the dollars are going. And I also have a clear understanding of how my agent is being compensated and what that relationship uh, will look like, will potentially look like. That, that gives a clear understanding. I know exactly how much my agent's going to make uh, based on those designs, at least just looking at Mass Mutual. But uh, whoever, whomever you're working with, you could obviously you know, ask what those um, commission numbers are. Uh, this and you can kind of run it yourself, base it off this video and kind of see, well, OK, well, every whole life insurance company basically works like this. They have a base premium percentage payout, which increases based on the volume that your agent is doing. So they're getting rewarded. Right. And then there's a smaller commissionable payout on a yearly basis, usually up to 10 years, no longer than that. Some go longer for the most part. Stops right at 10. And that number is like 2%, maybe three, something like that. Um, and when we're looking at L100 or a heck V design, if my intent as the client is to have as much cash value day one up front, and I only plan on funding it for a set period of time, say 10 years, well, then just looking at math, not people's opinions or philosophies here, math shows that based on how insurance companies reward the agents and how they charge for the insurance itself, you're going to have more cash value up front with that 1090 uh, heck V design, right? As opposed to an L100, right? And, right. Um, and so you have more cash value up front, but not necessarily long term. Is that correct? Do I have that as, as it relates to an L100? So that means the client needs to think, you know, what is my likelihood? Am I going to fund this till I'm 95 years old? Like, do I really plan on doing that or even 75 or even 65? If I only, if I'm 40 years old and I just want to put cash over here and store it. For the next you know 10 15 years or so does it make sense for me to be paying extra costs to have the ability to fund for an additional 15 more years 20 years the answer might be yes and if that's yeah. the case go go you're going to want to go with the l100 or else you're going to get you're going to be uh dragging the performance on a heck v design right I mean, yeah you've right. got it okay cool mm -hmm. yeah and sometimes it Sometimes a high early cash value now, a couple of years ago, this was not the case, but now it can even, it often does outperform a whole life 100 long term. Like what we do is just show them side by side if someone's interested and that way they can decide what option is, is best for them. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. good. This is good stuff. I, I, yeah. I enjoyed this session. Um, so we covered agents commissions uh, regarding base premium, PUAs, we showed three different designs, all you know, showing the same uh, strategy, where same age, same gender, same funding amount. What, what changes is really where the money is going. Is your money going to base premium? If so, it's going to reward the agent more than yourself. So that's kind right. of generally speaking there, right? Versus if my money is going majority to cash value, or in other words, PUA, and minimal to base premium according to what's allowed, 
then my cash value will have a higher yield in the beginning years, which means I can extract that money, borrow against it. And that's where the real magic occurs, right? Because access to capital, yeah. Right, because the we all know that the performance in the policy itself is not the sexiest thing on planet Earth as it relates to yields and, and you know, when you look at investment, but it's the ability to borrow against and go earn those much higher rates. So if I have more money, I usually mm -hmm. ask my clients this, technically whoever has more money wins, right? Like if I have the ability to put more money into a policy and then have more show up in cash for, for me to be able to exercise into the marketplace, then who, who wins? Who, who, who has a better chance of winning and using these dollars multiple times? Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like wh where I'm thinking. Now, here's an objection for you, Steve, which is like, okay, that's great. You know, 1090 is, is cool. And yeah, high cash value up front. But what about those objections that I hear where they say, well, that policy can become a mech because you got that term expense and that term cost uh, actually exceeds the cost of the base premium. So I don't know if you want to go back to those numbers and show like, hey, if you totaled up the term costs plus the base premium, because that's the only other component that doesn't exist in the 4060 HEC V design is there's no term in the mm -hmm. 4060 HEC V. But in the 1090 HEC V, there is a base and there's a term. So that's an additional expense. So my question to you, Steve, was, would be like, Hey, does that um, end up being more in costs when we factor in that term? Because I heard, you know, term gets more expensive year after yeah. year and it can explode on me. And so I'm concerned about my policy becoming a mech. I don't want that to become a mech. Everybody says, you know, you don't want that. So how do we yeah, solve good, for that? Good questions. So to hit on your question, with respect to the mech testing, can my policy run into a mech long term with a low base premium? The answer is no. If the agent does his or her job in properly stress testing the policy, and it's pretty easy to do. One, you'll see in the software, if based on the present dividend rate, that policy will mech. The simple way to, to stress test it, and this is for agents, if you're getting a policy, you can ask agents to do this, is can you run the illustration based on the guarantees, based on a, a conservative dividend, a midpoint dividend, we can use that terminology. Can you run it with those conservative rates and see if the policy will mech? Because a trap people have fallen into over the years where I've seen this occur, people that have brought their policies to us, is on the original illustration, based on the dividend rate at that point in time, there's no mech. Years passed, they continue to make payments, dividends came down, the death benefit, which has a direct relationship to the MEC limit, the death benefit did not appreciate as fast as originally projected, the person ran into a MEC. So that's one case. Another case where MECs occur is where an agent was under the understanding that the MEC test only lasts for the first seven years. So they do max fund a policy, they drop the term rider after seven years and continue to max fund it. That's been a case as well. Um, so it's just really having the I don't want to say insight, but just taking the extra steps to stress test a policy to make sure it does not mech. That's pretty simple to do. And then your other question on the term cost, I mean, that won't, <laughs> I don't know how to put this. No matter how high that term cost gets, it's always going to be lower than going with a gigantic base premium with no term rider. Like, a minimum base premium will minimize your costs. And if that term rider becomes expensive, if you're max funding it, the growth will always exceed the term cost. If you're not max funding it and the term becomes begins to become expensive, then we can just partially reduce it or remove it altogether and we don't have to worry about it. Like we've got control to remove that if possible. Like a lot of times we just see that you know, people will use, I hate to say this even, scare tactics to try and move people away from a term rider, really because it lowers the base premium. Which, which affects the agent's the commission. Just to, to hit the nail on the head. I mean, that's often the tactics that go on. Like you don't want to add 
term insurance riders because they're very expensive. It's like, first off, they're not. And secondly, when you look at them, they, you still save so much more money than you would if you go with this high base premium. Like it's a bunch of games that go on to try and upsell a, a higher premium product. Gotcha. Because at the end of the day, we're, we're talking about cutting majority of agents' commissions 80 plus percent. Correct. Like, and we're not saying agents shouldn't make money. I mean, that's how we drive our business. Right, <laughs> no. transparency. But if it's the consumer's money, then you can't, you can't take more money for yourself at the, at the, at the, uh, at sacri- by sacrificing the consumer's cash value and then try and justify it. Like if they want maximum cash value, show them how to do that and just be upfront. And, right. you'll, and if you, and if you look yeah. at the cost on the 1090 heck V design, if I'm not mistaken, that's 150 grand of base premiums at that 10K number, yeah. and then maybe 20,000 or so in term costs over those same 15 years. So you're looking at like 170 plus thousand as opposed to $40,000 times 10 years, $400,000 in, in insurance expense and costs, not including the PUA fee, right? Sure. So it's like, Oh my goodness, what a what a drastic change in insurance expense uh for for relatively similar results. Like when we look at you know year 10, 1090 has 1.138 million yeah. and then 4060 has 1.1 million. Mm-hmm. So it's less and it cost me an exorbitant amount of money more to end up with a lesser result. And even if it, I don't know, was higher, how much higher are we talking? Uh, where it's like, well, if I'm gonna, now that I know that for the same dollar amount, 100 grand over 10 years, that's what it gets me with the minimum base premium. Well, then the question becomes, well, For a $40,000 base premium, shouldn't I have the ability to put in $400,000? And that would would mean $4 million going into the policy. So it's like, oh, well, in that event, if I'm a client and I have the ability to pay in 100 now, and then I go and 10X my income, I can always just get a second policy for, say, a $40,000 base. And I've, you know, greatly increased my income and now I'm I have the ability to put more money in four hundred two yeah. policies as opposed to one fat policy with a high base premium. Yeah. These are the questions um the audience needs to be asking themselves is like, hey, look, how much money can you actually get into these things? Yeah. And who are, and I'm assuming whoever puts in more money wins because they're all of the policies are basically giving the same dividend rate. It's the same insurance company. So it's paying the same rate of, yeah. of return. Uh, and that's what shocks me as a, not only as an agent, but also a, a consumer. I'm a client, you know, I have two policies and that's where I look at that. I'm like, wow, this is a extremely large difference here. It's, it's massive. Yeah. Um, yeah. The 400 K to do that, you would need a term rider in this case to really push that death benefit up. <laughs> that would be high. Mm-hmm. Right, and even then, even that term rider is extremely cheaper. Oh, than, yeah. Then, then, then being able, then paying in four hundred grand, and having a forty percent premium, so one hundred sixty grand premium. Right. Correct. What a payday that is for the insurance agent. Co- correct, and I mean, and again, I don't want to go off on something that can be interpreted as an agent attack because that's not the intention one bit but when you look at it i mean the the industry in itself it does incentivize incentivize agents to sell products that are more weighted toward premium which are which result in less cash value just when you look at how compensation is paid how you look at incentives that's 100 percent how the industry is designed and if you want to take the approach as an agent, or if you're in the business and you want to get involved in this and you say, hey, I want to go with what's in the best interest of the consumer and my marketplace is interested in cash value, like that's the goal here. So if you're doing that, 
you do need to have the, um, how can I put this? You need to take the delayed gratification approach because that's the only way it really works. You're not going to make much in the beginning. It is a snowball effect from a residual standpoint. Right. You need a decent amount of volume. And then just through experience, I've learned you've got to delay gratification even more and continue to do that. Because if you have a large volume of clients, you do not want to neglect the service work. So you need to hire people to help train them, uh, train them properly. It's a lot of work and a lot of time that goes into it. So it's 100% a long-term game if you're going to do that. Right. And the last thing that I'll uh, close with is regarding that objection where you answered my question regarding term costs being too high, potentially creating a mech. The reality is the way policies become mechs is through, say, malpractice and not the agent not knowing the options that he or she has mm -hmm. where, you know, you have to be able to manage your client's policies where it's like, okay, for the last five years, my client's been paying in a hundred grand a year. And then year six, he or she paid in 50 grand. And so I would need to have a conversation with that client and say, hey, do you plan on getting the full hundred that year? And, he's like, and he or she says, no, I only want to pay in 50 now for the next five years and then I'm done. So at that point, the agent ought to reduce that term cost, right? That yeah. would be the next best move or else you're saying mech can occur at that Correct. point. Correct. Or the term costs get too high. Or the term uh, cost gets too high, which puts a drag on the cash value performance. Yeah, that's a main thing. And we yeah. reduced them for some people when they, you know, we've started too high, they bit off more than I could chew. Like that, that's okay. And some people keep it high for a little bit because you can make catch up payments, right? Catch up to the payments. Next limit. Yeah. Yeah. Term riders allow you to do that. I had conversations with someone yesterday. He he pays in on average about 80K per year. He missed one year, said, Hey, like how what can I do here? I'm like, oh, we can make up for lost time. So we modeled a hundred sixty thousand dollar payment going in next year. He's like, I can do that. Like, yeah, here's the Enforce, Enforce software. We just pulled it up and showed it. Like, all right, how do I do that right now? I'm like, well, here's the limitations. Here's the company. Point is, to your point, just going through the conversation, hitting on the talking point, showing everything up front, not just telling you what you can and can't do, but show it. People are going to believe what they can see, not only what they can hear. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And with that, we'll close it out here. Thank you so much uh, for inviting you. me on your channel again. And for those that are watching, any other you know questions, concerns, definitely comment below or reach out to any one of us. Happy to help. Absolutely. Thank you, Denzel, for your time as always. Thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below. We've also got Denzel's contact information below. And until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye. Hey, guys. Steve Parisi here. If you enjoyed the content you just saw, please subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell for future videos. If you'd like more information or to see some custom policies for yourself, feel free to call or email our offices at the contact information below.